Good evening. It's kind of you to return. I have a bedtime story for you. There are, it would appear, certain wholly unremarkable persons with none of the characteristics that invite adventure, who yet once or twice in the course of their smooth lives undergo an experience so strange that the world catches its breath. Dull, ordinary folk have no right to out-of-the-way experiences, yet there could be no question that something did actually happen to little Arthur Vezin. He was on his way home when it happened, crossing northern France, and the train was jammed to suffocation, most of the passengers being unredeemed holiday English. And when the train stopped for ten panting minutes at the little station, and he got out to stretch his legs on the platform, the idea of staying a night in this little town and going on next day by a slower, emptier train flashed into his mind. And for once, he acted with decision and rushed to snatch his bag. Then, of course, the train rushed off and left Fezin standing on the platform alone and rather forlorn. The little town climbed in straggling fashion up a sharp hill, rising out of the plain at the back of the station, and was crowned by the twin towers of the ruined cathedral peeping over the summit. He walked softly, almost on tiptoe, down the winding narrow streets where the gables all but met over his head, and he entered the doorway of the solitary inn with a deprecating and modest demeanour that was in itself an apology for intruding upon the place and disturbing its dream. And coming downstairs for a little promenade in the town before dinner, he encountered the proprietress. She was a large woman whose hands, feet and features seemed to swim towards him out of vivacious eyes that counteracted the bulk of her body and betrayed the fact that in reality she was both vigorous and alert. When he first caught sight of her, she was knitting in a low chair against the sunlight of the wall, and something at once made him see her as a great tabby cat, dozing yet awake, heavily sleepy, and yet at the same time prepared for instantaneous action. A great mouser on the watch occurred to him. About the streets of that little town he meandered gently, falling deeper and deeper into the spirit of repose that characterised it. The September sunshine fell slantingly over the roofs. Down winding alleys, fringed with tumbling gables and open casements, he caught fairy-like glimpses of the great plain below, and of the meadows and yellow copses lying like a dream map in the haze. The spell of the past held very potently here, he felt. No one took any notice of him, or turned to stare at his obviously English appearance. He was in a shop when it came to him first. He was buying socks and struggling with his dreadful French, when it struck him that the woman in the shop did not care two pins whether he bought anything or not. She was indifferent whether she made a sale or did not make a sale. She was only pretending to sell. For the whole town, he suddenly realised, was something other than he so far saw it. The real activities and interests of the people were elsewhere and otherwise than appeared. Vezin stayed on from day to day, indefinitely, much longer than he had intended. He felt in a kind of dazed, somnolent condition. And it became clear to him every day that he was never free himself from observation. The town watched him as a cat watches a mouse. It was on the fifth day that he made a definite discovery. It was dusk, and the oil lamps had not yet been lit in the passages. Halfway down the last passage to his own chamber there was a sharp turn, and it was just here, while groping round the walls with outstretched hands, that his fingers touched something that was not wall, something that moved. It was soft and warm in texture, indescribably fragrant and about the height of his shoulder, and he immediately thought of a furry, sweet-smelling kitten. The next minute he knew it was something quite different. Vazin almost ran down the remaining distance and entered his room with a rush, locking the door hurriedly behind him. Yet it was not fear that made him run. It was excitement, pleasurable excitement. Warm currents of life ran all over him and mounted to his brain in a whirl of soft delight. When a knock came at length upon his door and he heard the waiter's voice suggesting that dinner was nearly over, he pulled himself together and slowly made his way downstairs into the dining room. He took his customary seat in the far corner and began to eat. 
Then he became aware that the other guests were rising one by one in their places and exchanging greetings with someone who passed among them. And when at length he turned, with his heart beating furiously, he saw the form of a young girl, lithe and slim, moving down the centre of the room and making straight for his own table in the corner. She was addressing him. He was aware that she greeted him with a charming little bow, that her beautiful large eyes looked searchingly into his own, that the perfume he'd noticed in the dark passage again assailed his nostrils. She was quite close to him. That was the chief thing he knew, explaining that she'd been asking after the comfort of her mother's guests and was now introducing herself to the latest arrival, himself. Vezin half rose to acknowledge the pretty speech and to stammer some sort of reply, but as he did so his hand by chance touched her own that was resting upon the table, and a shock that was for all the world like a shock of electricity passed from her skin into his body. He caught her eyes fixed upon his own with a look of most curious intentness, and the next moment he knew that he had sat down wordless again in his chair, that the girl was already halfway across the room, and that he was trying to eat his salad with a dessert spoon and a knife. Their intimacy grew very rapidly after this first encounter. The girl was always modestly behaved, and as her mother's representative she naturally had to do with the guests in the hotel. Besides, she was young, she was charmingly pretty, she was French, and she obviously liked him. Conversations with Mademoiselle Ilse became more and more frequent and pleasant. They went over the town together, and she showed him the sombre, aristocratic-looking mansion where her mother's family dwelt for centuries, and the ancient marketplace where several hundred years before the witches had been burnt by the score. Only one curious incident came to disturb and puzzle him, a slight in itself, but utterly inexplicable. He had merely pointed to a column of blue smoke that rose from the burning autumn leaves and had then called her to his side to watch the flames shooting here and there through the heap of rubbish. Yet, at the sight of it, as though taken by surprise, her face had altered dreadfully, and she turned and ran like the wind, calling out wild sentences to him as she ran, of which she did not understand a single word, except that the fire apparently frightened her, and she wanted to get quickly away from it and to get him away too. Yet five minutes later she was as calm and happy again as though nothing had happened to alarm or waken troubled thoughts in her, and they had both forgotten the incident. They were leaning over the ruined ramparts together. No one was about. Driven by some remorseless engine within, he began to stammer something, he hardly knew what, of his strange admiration for her. Oh, I'm so glad, she said, clapping her hands softly in his face. So very glad, because... That means if you like me, you must also like what I belong to. You will take part in our real life, I mean, she added softly, with an indescribable coaxing of manner, as though she noticed his shrinking. You will come back to us. I possess the spell to conquer you and hold you. I mean to have you, for you love me and are utterly at my mercy. You had to come, for I own you. And I claim you. At this, little Vezin utterly lost his head. Delight tore at his heart and swept him into sheer ecstasy. To hear that sweet singing voice and see those adorable little lips utter such things upset his balance beyond all hope of control. He took her in his arms and covered her unresisting face with kisses. But even while he did so, and while the hot passion swept him, he felt that she was soft and loathsome, and that her answering kisses stained his very soul. And when presently she'd freed herself and vanished into the darkness, he stood there, leaning against the wall in a state of collapse, creeping with horror from the touch of her yielding body, and inwardly raging at the weakness that he already dimly realized must prove his undoing and from the shadows of the old buildings into which she disappeared there rose in the stillness of the night a singular, long-drawn cry, which at first he took for laughter, but which later he was sure he recognised as the almost human wailing of a cat. For a long time Vezin leant there against the wall, alone with his surging thoughts and emotions, 
The moon, pale and enormous, was just rising over the sea-like plain when at last he rose to go. Nervously, he peered about him. He knew a pathway descended to the high road, along which he could make good his escape to one of the other little towns that lay to the northward and so to the railway. But first he paused and gazed out over the scene at his feet where the great plain lay, like a silver map of some dream country. The breath caught in his throat, and he stood stock still as though transfixed when his gaze fell upon the near prospect in the depth of the valley at his feet. The whole lower slopes of the hill were aglow, and through the glare he saw countless moving forms, shifting thick and fast between the openings of the trees, while overhead he discerned flying shapes that hovered darkly one moment against the sky and then settled down with cries and weird singing through the branches into the region that was aflame. But in that very instant, as he stood hovering, a sudden movement among the shadows of the houses caught his eye, and he turned to see the outline of a large animal dart swiftly across the open space behind him and land with a flying leap upon the top of the wall a little lower down. It ran like the wind to his feet and then rose up beside him upon the ramparts. A shiver seemed to run through the moonlight and his sight trembled for a second. His heart pulsed fearfully. Ilse stood beside him, peering into his face. See, she cried, pointing with an arm in which the rags fluttered in the rising wind toward the forest to glow in the distance. See while well, they are with us. The woods are alive. Already the great ones are there, and the dance will soon begin. The salve is here. Anoint yourself, and come. Her hands touched the skin of his face and neck, streaking him with the burning salve that sent the old magic into his blood with the power before, which fades all that is good. Just saving himself from the dreadful plunge, Vezin struggled to release himself from her grasp, while the passion tore at his reins and all but mastered him. The crying of hoarse voices smote upon his ears, coming closer. You say clung to him with her long, shining arms, smooth and bare, holding him fast about the neck. But not Ilse alone, for a dozen of them surrounded him, dropping out of the air. He caught his foot upon a loose stone in the edge of the wall and then fell with a sudden crash onto the ground below. And they too came in a tumbling heap about him like flies upon a piece of food. But as they fell, he was released for a moment from the power of their touch, and in that brief instant of freedom there flashed into his mind the sudden intuition that saved him. Quick as a flash, he found his matches and lit the dead leaves that lay under the wall. Dry and withered, they caught fire at once, and the wind carried the flame in a long line down the length of the wall, licking upwards as it ran. And with shrieks and wailings, the crowded row of forms upon the top melted away into the air on the other side and were gone, with a great rush and whirring of their bodies down into the heart of the haunted valley, leaving Vezin breathless and shaken in the middle of the deserted ground. With one last shuddering look at the ruined ramparts and a feeling of horrid wonder for the haunted valley beyond, he turned his face away from the town and slowly made his way in the direction of the railway. Well, I expect you're ready for your rest now. I hope it will be undisturbed. Sleep well.